Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek VR News for Wednesday, November 30th, 2016. Let's jump right into VR news, guys. Start with some VR preamble. An apology up front. If my throat croaks or squeaks, it's because, yeah, it's pretty sore right now. I'm trying to keep it lubricated with Fisherman's Friends uh, and, and my beer here. And those two don't mix. So I'm filming the video, but uh, probably going to do water outside of it. All right. So the first bit of preamble, PlayStation Plus. So for those who don't know, it's a subscription uh, service and among other things gives you access to discounts on PlayStation titles, even a handful of free games. Now, I had the service, liked it, didn't renew with the PlayStation 4 because there weren't a lot of games at the time. And then, of course, the Rift and the Vive came out. It's only when the PlayStation VR came out that I revisited it to take a look and, you know, would decide on renewing if and when VR games start appearing. Well, the first game with VR capability is now official. And it's a game called Hypervoid. It is a non-VR game itself. It's an indie game, but there's a VR downloadable extra content kind of companion that you download to give you VR capability. So if there's anybody out there that has PlayStation VR and PlayStation Plus, if you can get this and let me know, that would be awesome. I'd love to hear from you. All right. So the next thing, Super Data. These are the guys that had the stats on uh, estimated PlayStation VR sales by year end, Vive, Rift, Gear VR, etc. They are downgrading their estimate for Sony PlayStation units sold uh, PlayStation 4 down to 745,434 units. And they're citing the reason for that as being the focus by Sony on PlayStation 4 Pro, that as a result, PlayStation VR isn't going to sell as briskly, but that it's still in comfortable territory and will continue to perform strongly into and hopefully beyond 2017. Next news piece, this one from the irishexaminer.com, a story about the first virtual reality arcade, this one uh, first in the UK, in Edinburgh, Scotland, in a mall called the Ocean Terminal Shopping Centre, once again in Edinburgh, and it's going to offer 16 games, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. are the hours of the arcade, Prices, £8.50 for one five minutes. That's 15 minutes. And on the high end, 90 minutes at £100 in your own room that you can rent for up to eight people. Now, the website has all the prices for the in-between, excuse me, throat. Yeah, the website has the in-between as well. All right, first news piece. This is uh, from Ars Technica, which is a, a techie website I really love. It's got a good mix of stuff. They are reporting a company. They've got a treadmill, omnidirectional treadmill, which we've seen many times. And they're touting that as having the ability to combat a lot of the motion sickness out there. Now, we've known for a while here on this channel and that video from the other day with just a wealth of feedback from you guys that a big reason for the motion sickness is the disconnect between brain, body, and experience slash game. When those are out of sync, motion sickness can occur. So a treadmill obviously makes sense. Your body's actually moving. In the game, it's moving. Your brain can connect the two. Is it going to work in every instance? No. Is it going to work for everybody? No. Is it bulky as hell? Yes. Is it costly? Yes. So it will be a solution for some people, but they got to have the space and the resources to purchase it. And of course, like I said, benefit from it in the first place for that to be a solution. So just wanted to clarify, it gets quickly thrown around. Oh my God, there's a cure for motion sickness. Slow down, gear down on your big rig, and let's examine it a little bit more. 
and that's what you get a very specific set of variables in that solution all right next up future mark explaining why vr benchmarking is a lot more complicated and it's taken them a while for the full version so they get into a lot in this article really good article to read definitely calls for its own video which i will be doing i think uh, dealing with not only the benchmark itself but the ramifications and what they're getting at and why they're getting at it they explain some of that in the article so they talk about the range of machines that are out there and it's not just a simple matter of gpu plus cpu equals frame rate there are software enhancements that inflate frame rate right you've got stuff out there where frames are getting inserted to bring it up to that magic number it's how you differentiate between that and they think they've nailed that with their vr mark they've taken those factors and others into account so you've got a range of possibilities from a to d d being yeah the very low end that only with that technology can it achieve the bare minimum so i thought that was a good approach and like i said deserves a video of its own Next up, IMX Labs Rob Burdow explains what VR opens up for Star Wars. Now, what I like about this article is the quote from one of the Star Wars directors. And he's basically talking about the first time putting the VR on his head. And basically utters... I love this better in real life. And the VR people, dismayed, heart sinks. Oh, crap, he doesn't like the VR. He prefers real life. That was clarified by the assistant to say, no, 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 no. This is his real life. Normally, what he does is he looks at a two, you know, a 2D blueprint on paper. Here in VR, he can see it. The set piece, that concept art as if it is real life. So I thought that was an awesome distinction and just sets up the article in a good way. So yeah, they explore all of that. What they learned from Trials of Tatooine, which most of us agreed was awesome, but short, but free. And uh, yeah, those types of things. The learning experiences of that, the fact that future stuff they release is probably not gonna be Skyrim epic length because of the cost benefit ratio but it's going to be incremental and it's going to get better and it's going to incorporate every time what they learned in the previous project so good good read next up oculus experimental setups so this has to do with room scale there's going to be several pictures here the first picture is vive at the maximum extent you got that big old vive you know I think it's 11 feet by 11 feet. Yeah, 11 feet, 5 inches by 11 feet, 5 inches, which is 3.5 meters. Second picture shows Oculus with two cameras. So a two-camera configuration. And they're also maximum extent apart. You get a space of 5 feet by 5 feet or 1.5 meters by 1.5 meters play space. That's trackable play space. And then the third picture shows the oculus with a three camera configuration which results in a play space of 8.2 feet by 8.2 feet or 2.5 meters by 2.5 meters tracked playable space what i liked about this or actually what i didn't like about this was the typical fanboys from either side arming up and duking it out as keyboard warriors in the middle ground there for really what amounted to much ado about nothing here's why and most of you and myself included we've kind of said it till we're blue in the face it's about the game some of you absolutely you've got one platform but you're not all militaristic about it or you know what you can get passionate but it's generally in a rational manner right this these discussions and you can read the link they weren't rational it was the opposite, the shoot from the hip fanboy style, right? My whole thing is look, because they use the whole maximum play space greater on the Vive than Rift, Rift sucks. Well, 
gear down on the big rig. Let's look at that. So you've got 11 foot by 11 foot potential. I have never once, with all this space I have here in the man cave, been able to achieve the maximum playable space. I would need to slide all the furniture to one side, which is totally impractical and not something I would ever be able to do on a regular basis. End result, I've never once used the maximum amount of play space that I can think of. Likewise, what I have had is the minimum on occasion. Uh, if I'm boxed in here and I don't want to see the garbage bag hanging from window and frame, yeah, I get it to the minimum. So that is possible, right? So for how many people is that realistic? For most, no. The average is going to be about the same for both Rift and both Vive. So just play the damn game and be happy with the room scale at likely an average setting for your environment. Next up, we've got how theaters are evolving to include VR experiences. And it's a slow process. This theater in Amsterdam that the article's about, they renew their content generally once a month. You have three showings. They're uh, 30 minutes each, 12 euros and then 50 cents or $15 US if you convert it for each of those. So it's two to three that you can sign up or pay for and then watch. And what they get into is how 8K will really benefit them and is probably more feasible for them to achieve earlier than the home environment because they don't have the tracking requirements of, you know, the homegrown PC stuff, which is true. They don't. You're seated for the entire experience. They've had over 50,000 visitors to their theater in Amsterdam already. Very cool. And it's called the VR Cinema. And sorry, just one more. Next up, we've got a Indiegogo campaign from Insta. It's called the Insta360 Air 360 VR Clip-On Camera for Android smartphones. It's a 360 camera plugs into the camera's USB. She was asking for 20,000, she being Bianca Zhang from Shenzhen, China. She was asking for 20, she raised 34,676 with still a month to go, which is 173% of her goal. So I like the concept, I'm curious on the final price. Every time I've looked to get a camera, it's just been cost prohibitive. That's kind of been my barrier to entry. It's just costed too much. So. I'd love to see what this gets priced at once it goes to market, assuming it's completely successful. Next news piece, a study that suggests that VR can have a huge impact in the classroom. So most of this study is kind of common sense. We know students who are bored with the status quo format might get stimulated and excited by a history class that recreates that battle in VR. All kinds of potential. We know that. We've talked about it. This study, or it calls itself a study though, was immediately suspect by me. You know, the, the skeptical radar went off when I saw who was conducting it. So this is a study for VR in the education sector. Keep that in mind. So the two companies involved, the first one, Beijing Blue Focus, e-commerce company and the second Beijing Ibocan Wisdom Mobile Internet Technology Training Institution. Bias here? Hmm. <laughs> so totally lopsided bias wise. Like I said, the concept I still agree with. I think students would benefit. But ultimately, how valid is this study? I would love to see that peer-reviewed in the sense of a truly, well, or as unbiased as you can get, third party before I put any validity to the study. All right, that's it for the news, guys. Again, apologies for my failing voice, uh, which is really dying right now. As always, cheers, guys, and definitely catch you on the VR flip side.